All right, I guess I'm ready. Sorry about the uh, technical difficulties. These gremlins always appear when you don't want them. Well, my name is John Draper. I'm not often known as Captain Crunch. I've been around the computing industry for a very, very long time, back in the days of the IBM 360. And I want to talk today about the history of phone freaking, or what phone freaking is all about. Phone freaking is originated by a lot of blind people because their whole world is sound. They have no sight. They only have sound. And sound is what you can get out of a telephone. I was in the US Air Force station in Maine when I heard a news article about this guy by the name of Joe Ingressia. He's sometimes also known as, uh, as Joy Bubbles, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago. And uh, while I was in the Air Force, I was stationed at the most remote we uh, site you can ever imagine, almost on the Arctic Circle. It was totally remote, 70 people living up there. Uh, two or three people rotate out, and then two or three people rotate in every week. And uh, they have this thing called call night every Friday. And you can make a call home and talk for 20 minutes on the phone to whoever you wanted to call, compliments of the US Air Force's. Uh, switchboard operators in various different places in NORAD central headquarters as well as Sunnyvale Satellite Test Center which had lines very very close to where I lived so I would call the operator at the satellite test center and she'll ask me what number I want to call and I just call the San Jose number free call that was my first uh, introduction to free calls and I said to myself well gee why should I have to wait for call night why can't I just call the uh, call the satellite test center myself well um, Unfortunately, uh, you had to know the right codes in order to do that. It took me a while before I could figure it out. And I had lots and lots of time on my hands. So what I did was I just started dialing random numbers and found out that 123 would give me access to the Audubon dial tone. And the Audubon dial tone would then let me dial up any, any military base on the US military network, including Army, Navy, Air Force. They all share the same telephone network called Audubon. Uh, that network does not exist anymore, by the way, but it did. And I was able to use that Audubon network, and uh, I got myself an Audubon telephone directory from the orderly room, who were there. People were very happy to give that to me, knowing that I probably couldn't make much use out of it. And so I, therefore, started to experimenting around, and I noticed that the telephone company on the Audubon network was very similar to the uh, private sector network used by the AT&T Ma Bell. The uh, ability to call and make phone calls anytime I wanted to certainly boosted my morale. I am also a ham operator, WB6EWU, former ham operator that is. And uh, I was also operating from the Mars station, that's MARS, Military Amateur Radio Service. And I was able to only, uh, I, I mean, all I could hear were Russians, because I was up in Alaska. And uh, I'm not allowed to talk to Russians. It's against the military, uh, against the military protocol. They were our quote unquote enemy at the time. So I get back home from the Air Force to uh, get a job at a defense company called American Astronautics. And uh, I had a security clearance. So I go into this company and say, hey, uh, I'm, I want to apply for a technician job. And I go and talk to the engineer. And I show him my, uh, my DD-214 form. And which has my latest security classification uh, details. He said, come to work first thing in the morning. Oh, great. I got myself a job that quick, just walking in, next day I'm working. I mean, when you have a security clearance and, uh, and you're working in the defense industry during the Vietnam War, <laughs> you tend to get noticed. And while I was working, I was also experimenting around with testing FM transmitters, because after all, I'm a radio guy. I like to build radio transmitters. So I built a 25 watt transmitter and I just hooked it to an antenna, hung it out the window, played some music, drove around a little bit, listened to the radio to see how far it would go. And then, it, and then I'd come back to my home and I'd, and I'd say, okay, anybody can hear me, call me at 264-8773. And sure enough, I get a call. And it was this guy, Denny, who later on turned out to be the blind kid. He gave me a loop around number to contact him. At the time, I didn't know what a loop around number was. So when I call the number, I get this loud tone. Uh, then he happens to call me back again two weeks later. Uh, he couldn't quite remember. He, he, he's got a photographic memory. 
so he could remember numbers, but he couldn't associate the number with me and the radio station. So I reminded him and he says, oh yeah. And I says, by the way, that number you gave me, what is that number? He said, that's a loop around number. I said, what's that? And he started to explain to me, uh, a loop around number is two numbers consecutively ordered, uh, 264 and 264 with the ones in my local exchange. If you call the 4-4 side, you get a tone, and somebody else calls the 4-5 side, the tone goes away and the two of you can talk. So it's a way of giving out a phone number without actually giving, giving out really who you are. It's kind of an, an anonymous phone number. And that became very handy when I was operating my, my pirate radio station, because I'd give out that number for people to call. So after visiting him a while, he gave me a little demo of how blue boxes worked. And he did this with an organ. And I said, I remember those tones. Those are what I used to make a long distance call. I could hear them kind of faint in the background. Well, well. So I says, yeah, that's how it works. He says, yeah, all you have to do is to get on a tandem. You call an 800 number. And then you use the 2600 whistle or a 2600 hertz tone in this case, and that tone would just simply uh, clear the line, and you would then make a call. It literally blew me away. I couldn't believe it, it was that easy to make a free phone call. Uh, well, why, why does this work? Well, AT&T, Ma Bell, the biggest monopoly in the whole wide world, had a very fatal flaw. Their fatal flaw is they used in-band signaling. This meant that the phone number that, you, that you're going to call gets transmitted over the same pair of the same trunk that you're talking on. So all you had to do is just in inject the right tones into a phone call, and you can control the, uh, the trunk level access, which means you can hang up from the trunk, you, uh, you let go of the 20 so you a little kerchink sound, and then you can, in a little soft hiss, and then just use a blue box to make calls. And this was how it worked. And so it allowed subscriber access to trunks via 2600 hertz, which is Captain Crunch whistle, which is how I became Captain Crunch. And it basically gives me operator privileges from a subscriber phone. Uh, for all you Unix geeks out there, that's just like getting root access to AT&T. I mean, big time root access to the entire telecommunications network. And uh, that's kind of how it all works. And now I want to uh, have a little break here and uh, see if I can bring in my other demo of tandem stacking. 1970s and maybe even early 80s. Number one crossbar tandems, also called crossbar tandems or XBTs for short. Well, there were certain XBTs that would allow you to stack. Youngstown, Ohio was one of them. Here, Ben uses it to call the phone next to him through many, many links. Step one was to get onto the long distance network, usually by just simply dialing a long distance call. Anything that was more than about 75 miles out would go over a type of carrier system that would respond to 2600. This was recorded in 1975, by the way. The number that's ringing at this point doesn't matter. What's important is that this call has gone over a trunk from New York to a distant 4A, which can be reset by 2600. That's the supervision handshake, off hook, on hook. And now it's waiting for new digits, which Ben will supply. Stopping the tape now, what he dialed was 216 054064. These are old routing codes. The network of the 1970s had routing codes for tandems in all major cities. I might add that there is one thing that he failed to mention. You had to have a key pulse tone at the very beginning of the number and an ST tone at the very end of the number. He really dialed six digits, not eight digits, although you did hear eight digits. The first code, 216. 054 is the routing code for Youngstown, Ohio. The 064 in the area code of 216 is the routing code for Canton, Ohio. Both of these are crossbar tandems. When Ben keys in this sequence, 
The 4A into which he is keying picks up a trunk to Youngstown, Ohio and sends 064. That tick is the 4A cutting through to Youngstown, Ohio after having sent 064. Now what does Youngstown do with the 064? Well, it picks up a trunk to Canton, that's the code for Canton, but having been sent only the routing code and no digits to follow it, it simply dumps us into the Canton trunk without sending anything. In other words, it stacks. That's the sound of Youngstown, Ohio dumping us into a trunk to Canton. And that's the handshake from Canton. Canton, Ohio is now ready to receive digits. That's 054064. This causes Canton to pick up a trunk to Youngstown and send 064. Now we're in Youngstown again, which stacks into Canton, and then Canton gives us the handshake. And we'll do another 054064. Now we're in Youngstown again. Youngstown stacks to Canton. That's the handshake. And here we go again. Same digits. Youngstown. Canton. Handshake. Now the connection has gotten so long that the handshake is all you can hear. Now on that supervision flash, you could really hear multiple links, both on the off hook and the on hook. He's going around again. That was such a short flash that you didn't get to hear all the on hooks. You've been listening to the beginning of the original 1975 tape, stretched to allow me to describe what's going on. Okay, there you have a little demonstration of how it is to stack tandems. You actually hear the, the sounds of little, those little chirps and clicks. Each time you go around the loop, you get, you, you get one, one more trunk, you get one more little chirp you hear. And uh, I believe the world's record was, I think, 26 hops. I'm not sure exactly. Um, that's one way of stacking tandems. Uh, later on, after 1975, I discovered uh, a little, an interesting uh, uh, thing about the bone company. It's called guard band. And what guard band does is if there's any other frequency besides 2600 that's present on the phone line, the 2600 does not activate. And the reason for that is if you have a high-pitched person talking on the phone, they have 2600 component in their voice, they'll disconnect the call. <laughs> we don't want that to happen. I'm sure that the phone company doesn't want that either. In fact, a lot of the times what we used to do, we used to go to airports, it's bank of telephones, uh, all these people talking on the phones, you can just sit there and we blow the Captain Crunch with as we're walking by and disconnect everybody. So that's pretty much uh, how that works. Uh, let me get back on my slides now here. So now let's come up to a little bit uh, of some other stuff that we used to do. And I want to talk a little bit about some kind of cool things that we did with this technology. Uh, because we were able to get into the trunk level access of the long distance lines, um, this was not subscriber level access. This is trunk level access. This is the internal switching system within the phone company. They use uh, three digits, four digits, and six digits for intertrunking communication. What you've heard there on the uh, tandem stack code were three digits, where they were stacking each one of the O codes. Usually these codes start with an O. Why? Because you can't dial an O and a prefix on a, on, on a telephone. You'll never find an American phone number ever with the exchange starting with a zero. And at the time, the area code never had anything but a zero or a one as the second digit. Since that time, after the AT&T breakup, the area code can be any digits now. There's no restrictions, primarily due to the fact that they're using electronic switching equipment and it's much smarter and can be reprogrammed to uh, have and not to be able to have re kind of these restrictions uh, going on. In fact, during the cutoff period, it was also possible for me to actually make a long distance call, get into the overseas center by just dialing a number. Uh, I would dial a number uh, uh, like, and then I would, I would say 188 as an exchange 
and as the area code, and it would connect me to the 188 Canadian Overseas Center. That was kind of cool. These special uh, codes also allowed you to go in to do what is called an auto-verify. Um, auto-verify is a system where the operators can, uh, if there's an emergency and the line is busy, th there has to be a way to break into a line to relinquish a line in case of an emergency, like to a doctor's office or to maybe just a home where, they, where you have a gabby 13-year-old kid get gabbing on the phone for hours at a time. And they implemented this system called auto-verify. Auto-verify is where you actually use a three-digit code within the same area code to actually access these numbers. For Oakland, California, that code was 052. So if you blew off a 2600 tone and landed in the 4152 trunk, which is the Oakland trunk, and then called do KP052, follow that with the phone number, and that worked anywhere within the 415 area code, which also included San Francisco, you would then um, click and you'd get dropped into a line and your kind of scrambled communications. And that would tell the operator that the line is in use, but the operator couldn't understand the conversation. Aha, uh -huh. there was one little flaw. If I gave it a quick burst of 2600, I could flash off that scrambled device and hear the conversation. That's what an operator would have to do, is she actually has to go into the phone line and tell the parties talking that there is an emergency and they should give up the line. Then she does a flash forward with 2600 hertz tone. She just presses a key on her switchboard. You get a flash and the conversation goes away the, the scrambled comedy, uh, conversation goes away, and then you will hear the conversation. But then the conversation will put a beep tone on the line every 10 seconds, indicating to the callers that the call is being recorded as by law. Well, what we did was we tapped the FBI's phone line. <laughs> uh, 415252 exchange happened to be one of those exchanges that you could actually listen in on a call. And so we sat there for a while and calls would start coming in and we'd listen to them for a while. And then there was this paranoid guy calling the FBI claiming that his phone's being tapped. And all of a sudden that 10 second beep tone comes along and the FBI agent says, yeah, it looks like they've got you tuned in, don't they? <laughs> and heard a bunch of, we heard a bunch of stuff about FBI agents like to play golf a lot. There wasn't really anything really, uh, really uh, earth shaking that we heard. We just knew that we could do it. Uh, other other com other lines too, like uh, 914052 start, uh, that would give you the uh, AT&T conference bridge. You have up to 10 lines and you could bring people in on a conference call. You can control who, who gets on and who gets off. Oh, phone freaks love that. And then of course you can call inward operators. These are operators in distant cities. Like if I wanted to call a New York operator, I could just dial 212121 because the 121 is the operator code for New York. Then later on, they implemented the overseas senders. 182, which covered the UK. 183, which covered uh, Europe. And then there was uh, 184, which covered another part of Europe. And they have 188 in Canada. And so, but United States didn't have very much relations with the Soviet Union at the time. So they didn't have direct lines to the Soviet Union. So they, they did have direct lines from Canada to the Soviet Union and from Bahrain to the Soviet Union. So what we were able to do was KP2 through Bahrain. The KP1 tone is a tone used for within the trunk itself. To leave the country, you have to use a KP2 tone. The KP2 tone is called the transit tone. That's your trans transiting from one country to the next. So we use the KP2 through Bahrain and dial seven for Russia, one for Moscow, and then the number in Moscow. And we'd love to call the US Embassy in Moscow because you're the only people we could talk to that spoke English. <laughs> Several years passed and, uh, and, uh, and this was like after my arrest and uh, I, I discovered that I was able to call 800 numbers and uh, I discovered that uh, by accident that I called an 800 number and got a, I got a dial tone. Well, that's interesting. But I tried to dial numbers, it would just give me back with some kind of a warble tone and some kind of error. So I tried one, two, three, four. I got another dial tone. Aha, uh -huh, I'm getting somewhere now. And so I dialed nine, got another dial tone. So I was actually calling from within that company's PBX system, dial nine to get outside, and it took me a while to figure out that eight one was the Watts line, that's what I was interested in, so I could make a free call compliments of that company that had a Dimension PBX. That's the name of the PBX, it's by AT&T. Dimension PBX, and that's, uh, that's uh, was one of the first programmable PBX systems built. 
And uh, during that time, I ran across a few friends. And during my scanning process, I happened to be scanning Washington, D.C. That's the perfect place to scan, because you know there's lots of interesting numbers in Washington, D.C. And so I discovered that 800-424-9337 went into a, uh, into a person that wasn't too happy about receiving a phone call from me. Uh, he told me to get off the line, he was very rude to me, and it kind of raised a few flags in my brain. So I took a little note of that, put a little checkbox next to the, next to the phone number in my, in my little red book. Two weeks later, I go to a phone freak uh, little meeting, and they like to trade numbers and codes and stuff like that. And I put this down as trade material, but before I did that, I wanted to find out really what that number was. So I had to come up with a story. This was my first encounter of social engineering. <laughs> so I called that number again, and this time I says, hi, this is uh, Bob over at the uh, White Plains 4A switching tandem office, AT&T Long Lines Division, and we're having some translation problems with your phone line. We would like to fix this as soon as possible. Who have we reached? And he said, oh, you've reached the White House CIA crisis hotline number. <laughs> so I used my auto verify to, uh, to, the first thing I had to do was, it was an 800 number, 800-424-9337 to be exact. But there was also, a, uh, there was also a, um, a, a, an equivalent 10-digit number to an 800 number. The, every, for every 800 number, you had to actually have a 10-digit number. They used six-digit translation translate the six digits, uh, 800424 into 202936 or something like that. Nine, and then the last four were the same, 9337. So I, I then found out, and then I found out that, hey, that's one of those exchanges that I can actually tap the line. So I sat there and I tapped the line for a while, and I was listening to the recordings. And I, sure enough, a call came in, and he says, uh, the guy, the caller said, uh, Olympus, please. One moment, sir, and what we thought, President Nixon come on the line. And so we're listening to a while, and then the guy says, guy says uh, uh, I want to alert you to a, a, a secure communication coming in to the Situation Room. Please uh, make sure that there's somebody there to receive this call. And then they disconnected the call, because th this line was not used for classified information, obviously. And so I wrote down, White House, CIA crisis hotline number. I gave this to my friend, Adam. And Adam says, oh, let's call this number and see what happens. <laughs> so we had, we had Olympus. That was the code name for Nixon. We had the phone number. We knew what to say. So we said, Olympus, please. Nixon came on the line. <laughs> and we told them that we had a national crisis on our hands. <laughs> we were out of toilet paper. And then immediately uh, another voice came on the line telling us who, who we were, asking us who we were. Of course, we weren't going to admit that. And of course, when we did call the White House, we did stack a few trunks, making sure that we weren't going to get traced. So that was kind of one of the pranks, I think one of the biggest pranks. And there's a lot more in my upcoming book. I've been frantically working on my book now. I've just signed a deal with, uh, with a Hollywood uh, uh, producer for their, their, they work on, uh, uh, at CBS TV, National national network. And this person is going to be uh, working toward putting me in contact with the right people in Hollywood to produce a uh, film and a book as well. And I'm going to write my own book with my iPad because I'm, I'm an iOS programmer. So I'm going to put a my book's going to be on the iPad with timeline. So I'll be able to pick like a timeline, like a year, 1957. Where was I doing in 1957? Click on 1957. Up comes Google Maps showing me where I lived in 1957 with a list of all my friends and testimony from my friends about me. And so we're going to do something like that. Uh, other hoax, hoaxes that we did also, we did the, uh, we found out that by calling Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara is a, is a town just north of uh, Los Angeles and south of San Francisco. It's along the coast. And this town has General Telephone as the, uh, as the operating telephone company. It wasn't AT&T, it was just an independent company. There, are, there were many small independent companies in small cities in the States. So I found out that by calling a number in Santa Barbara, by connecting two phone lines together, I would call and dial out on both phones at the same time. Well, normally, one would be busy, and then the other one would ring. The one that would ring would be the first one to come through. It's a mechanical switching system, so one's going to always come through before the other. But just by a quirk of fate, 
if you hit it exactly at the right time, you actually will get uh, connected to the line and both trunks simultaneously connect together. It shows as, as being off hook. If you grab the primary selector group, this is a selector group that if you call uh, on one line, if it's busy, it jumps to the next line, that line, it jumps to the next line, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we grab the very first line in that bank. So no matter what happened, calls started coming into Santa Barbara. So we were, and then what we did was, we we're telling call says, oh, you must have dialed the wrong number. And, and so I says, hmm, maybe we can make good use of this. Uh, yeah, let's do it. And I, I told him, no, you really don't want to do that. But he says he did it anyway. And I was kind of freaked out that he did it. But uh, what happened was he was telling callers that Santa Barbara had, been, had had a nuclear accident and that all of the people in Santa Barbara were in danger and to not call Santa Barbara or not travel to Santa Barbara until the situation was cleared. Uh, Moments later, press started calling, um, military people started calling, officials started calling, and it just became pandemonium. After about maybe 10 or 15 minutes, we decided we had enough. We hung up the phone and it all disappeared. Next day, it wound up in the LA Times. <laughs> and of course, I want to talk a little bit about the Waz pranks. Um, as you know, I've met Steve Wozniak in the days, uh, uh, I'm sure you've heard a lot of my stories. You've been visiting my uh, webcrunchers.com website. It's up there too. I talked about uh, the uh, Steve Wozniak, and Wozniak uh, basically had heard about the Esquire article when it came out. And he said, uh, I really got to know how to do this. He happened to have heard a radio interview that I did on KPFA, Pacifica, uh, non-commercial Berkeley station in Berkeley. And uh, I gave a demonstration of, of the blue box tannin stacking, not unlike what you just heard on the radio. Waz heard that and says, I got to get in touch with this guy. So Waz called KPFA and one of my friends at KPFA told me about Waz, gave, gave him Waz's number. Um, Waz was staying at the UC Berkeley dorm at the time, going to UC Berkeley. And uh, so he, uh, he gave me his number and I thought, well, I might as well just call a guy up and see what's going on. So I did. Eventually ran, arranged a meeting and Waz told me about his blue box that he built, but he didn't know how to use it. But his blue box was digital. It generated square waves. Now, square waves don't work very nicely on analog circuits. They generate all kinds of interharmonic distortions and other nasty things that can also bring great attention to your attempt at making free phone calls. And so we fiddled around with it for a while, and we got it to work. We had to place the mouthpiece just the right distance from the, uh, from the acoustical coupler to make it work. And uh, he says, well, can I, can I call overseas? Yeah, I guess so. Who do you want to call? Can I call the Pope? Sure, why not? So we called the Vatican. I called uh, Italy Information and got the number to the Vatican and uh, couldn't find anybody there to speak English. But after about 10 or 15 minutes, they found an English-speaking staff member at the Vatican. And Waz, I handed the phone back to Waz. I thought, I think they understand English here. You can talk to them. And Waz picked up the phone and he says, hi, I really got to talk to the Pope. It's extremely important. This is Henry Kissinger. I must confess my sins. <laughs> so after that, uh, they took a little while and they said, but the Pope's unavailable right now. Of course, it was 4.30 in the morning in Italy time. <laughs> so eventually that, 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 that effort pretty much was a washout, so I finally gave up. And then I gave Waz a very stern warning. I says, Waz, you really don't want to use that box very often because if you do, you're going to get caught because that box generates all kinds of trouble cards. And when you drop a trouble card, what it is, it's this little metallic card that gets punched out from the switching equipment and drops into this little hopper. And in that, on that card is information on the trunk number, the sender number that caused the error, and other information that the phone company technicians can use to track down, trace down the problem. And usually a sender will, will go broken, and uh, after the sender goes broken, uh, then it drops these trouble cards and they can very quickly fix the problem. When you do it with a blue box, especially with Waz's box, you do the same thing. And against my very stern advice, Waz decided that he wanted to sell it. Actually, it was Steve Jobs' idea. So Jobs says, let's make and sell these. Because Jobs, of course, is like kind of maker and seller of things, as we all know about that. So he said, uh, sure, uh, I guess so. Let's make a few and see what happens. So they made about uh, several, uh, several hundred of them, I think, as I recall. It 
And inside each little blue box, Waz put a little note saying he's got the whole world in his hands. And so one of those blue boxes found, was wound up in the hands of one of my phone freak friends who, I, against my stern advice, went and bought the damn thing anyway. I said, you really don't want to use that box. He says, but it's the only thing, again, and you won't build me one? Of course I'm not going to build one. I'm not going to contribute to the delinquency of a minor. That's illegal, because he was only like 17 years old, right? So I said, OK, uh, you, you know, you, you take your risk in your own hands when you do that. But what I didn't know was he got busted, and his phone book got confiscated by the police. In his phone book and everybody else's phone book that got busted, my phone number existed. I was branded the kingpin. Esquire article pumped me up as the kingpin of phone freaking, and I was pretty much, uh, I was pretty much busted. I knew, I knew eventually someday I, I was going to get, no matter what happened, I already know that I was going to get busted. Of course, I knew they got rid of all my stuff, and I was picked up in May 1972. Uh, the Esquire article came out in October 1971, and uh, Richard was, uh, was busted sometime in April. So it was only a month later after he got busted, they, they came on to me, they came in. Uh, I was just on my way home from college, and uh, I, I, I pulled into a 7-Eleven store to get something to eat, or get something at the store on my way home, and three FBI agents, or five of them, just came in, swooped in, grabbed me, took me into a car and took me down to the uh, Santa Clara County Jail Booking Department and got booked for uh, charge with Title 18, Section 1343, fraud by wire. Uh, I eventually got on probation, and uh, then I got entrapped again in 1976. Uh, at, and the same person who, by the way, called Nixon up was also the person who snitched on me. He set me up, on, uh, he set me up for a sting. I was in Palo Alto at the Homebrew Computer Club meeting, uh, and uh, there was a payphone right next to where they had the meeting, and uh, Adam hands the phone to me and says, hey, Dave wants to talk to you. I says, hi, Dave, how you doing? And of course, my voice was on the phone, voice prints equal John Draper, oops, they got me. So that was how they got, they got me the second time. Uh, they violated my probation, and I had to serve four months in uh, Lompoc Federal Prison, at which time I had phone freaking classes. Got me very popular, because when you're in jail, you gotta make friends with the biggest, most meanest person you can make. Otherwise, you're not gonna have a very pleasant time there at all. So I had classes, right in front of the noses of the cops. And I worked, it, it, Lompoc is kinda like a minimal, minimum federal detention facility. They just got barracks. There's no walls or anything. They just have these big stern signs that say, Out, outer limits, don't go past this point. I worked in the pig. I worked in the pig farm, and because uh, I I had farming experience before, and so I said, oh, why not? So I worked in the pig farm. It was fun. I enjoyed it. I like animals. So uh, one time I marked uh, the name of the judge on the pig, Big Sal. <laughs> and then also when I was there, I was uh, I was uh, I figured out how to detune the uh, the FM radios you get from the PX or from the commissary of the jail. You can buy a radio there. And it found out that I could uh, take off about 30 turns of wire on the local oscillator of the radio, and then I could raise the frequency that it can receive to 151 megahertz, which was the frequencies used by the cops and the, and, and the guards. So I had a way of tapping the guards' walkie-talkies now. So I knew exactly what was going on, and everybody liked me for that too, and I modified a few other radios on, while I was in the process of doing that as well. So that's sort of what I did in jail. Kept myself pretty busy. So what am I doing now? Well, like I said earlier, I've got a book deal and a possible movie on the works. I've got Crunch TV. Uh, I'm very active in social networking. I'm JD Crunchman on just about every social network you can find. Um, I'm also uh, building a consortium on, uh, on uh, energy and sustainability called EcoViso. Eco stands for ecology. Viso stands for vision. And uh, what we're doing is we're putting together a lot of information on how to live sustainably and how to, how to, how to transport yourself around without using gas. And uh, we're, we're putting a lot of information together on just about every kind of technology out there, including fringe technology, uh, dark matter, black holes, wormholes, stuff like UFO technology too, of course, and stuff like that. And then I just, uh, I'm just actually, just before coming to Europe, uh, we uh, filled out the paperwork for Crunch Creations, which is our new company now. It's an LLC operating out of in the state of California. We're waiting for Sacramento to give us our license. And uh, we have a team approach for large projects. 
and you can take notes on this. I didn't actually put this down on my, in my presentation because I had very little time in preparing for this. But it's crunchcreations.org. Uh, go up and take a look at it. We take a team approach to development of software. We are looking for people who are very highly specialized in a very, very specific niche. We, we, we put them into our database, and then when we need a particular person who is so good at doing what they can do, they can do it in their sleep, then we can get this person to build it for us, and we'll have them maybe work for like a weekend or something to do what, do what we want them to do. They would take another person a whole week to do. So we're able to crank out really high, sophisticated uh, technology very, very fast. And we have, a, we have a prototyping team. We call it faking the funk. And this is a term come from Hollywood. Faking the funk means just that. You're faking it. You're just using smoke and mirrors to make a website look like what it really would look like. Exactly. It would behave exactly like it would do. Lots of rich, rich Ajax, uh, jQuery stuff in it. But the data in the website is just bogus. That comes later. So then we show it to our client. One, one day later, we bring in our client. And we show it to him, and he says, how'd you get it done so fast? I says, oh, we, we just work fast and efficient. <laughs> and so we've got about maybe five or six teams. I gotta get, I've, I've got to put together a, a team for building games, for iOS games. So we're looking for people for that. And you can contact me uh, on the contact page, which is right there. And uh, so I have a Google Voice number, uh, which I use here. So I can receive phone calls from here. And uh, it's a local call for them. For me, I can make free calls to the states, free, legally, and not a problem. Uh, I'm also JD Crunchman on Skype, AIM, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and yes, of course, I did change my LinkedIn password. <laughs> uh, at this point, I'm going to have a seat here while you guys uh, ask me some questions. And uh, can you still hear me OK? There we go. So do I have any questions? This is a time you can ask me anything you want. Do I see any raise of hands? No questions? Oh, yeah, go ahead. So how, how do you feel about this, this, this asterisk and this, this software defined, not only radio, but also the phone system is opening and everybody becoming? Well, everybody's got their own phone company now yeah. with asterisk BBX servers. I had one at home for a while, too. Yeah, asterisk is great. I just didn't have time enough to set up a server, and uh, I myself am. Uh, yeah, I'm having some problems with my hosting service right now for EcoViso, so it's not even up right now. So I haven't been able to deal with that because because of, of my travels in Europe. I came here in uh, May of uh, 21st of May to speak in Krakow, Poland, at an event called uh, called Confidence. I had about maybe 300 people there, and then after the conference, I rode the hacker bus to uh, Berlin to go to Berlin Sides Conference. And since I lived in Berlin for a considerable length of time, I visited all my friends in Berlin. Then I went, and then at that point, I put out over my uh, Facebook page, anybody wants to visit me? Because by that time, Germany found out that I was in country. I was getting swarms of requests to go and visit them. And so my, my philosophy was this, you want me to visit you? You just pay for my train ticket, I'll, I'm there. And that's exactly how I've been able to travel around Germany, uh, pretty much by using that technique. Uh, so it's, uh, that way I get a chance to meet my fans and, 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 to, uh, and to get an idea of the, uh, of the uh, consciousness about me and who I am and, and, and prelude to the possible book and movie that I'm coming out with. So I'm going to report back to Hollywood after here and say, hey, well, look at all, look at all the responses I've been getting. And then that's going to really give me a, a lot of clout in Hollywood and make it even easier for me to sell my story. Do I see any other hands out there? No? Come on. Come on, raise your hand. This is the only chance to ask the crunch. <laughs> you can always see me after the show, too, because I'm probably going to be sticking around. So I think I'm pretty much finished, unless somebody else has more questions. Thank you.